Well, good morning to each of you. It is good to be able to uh, be back and joining us. We're launching a new series here. Um, and one of the things that is going to be a, a, a takeaway for you um, is how in the midst of craziness that we see all around us, God is in the midst of it, and he's doing things that are powerful, things that are extraordinary, things that are significant, but things that are not perceptible to many. That, that's the interesting thing about this whole, the whole concept of Jesus. How could a man come and do what he's done, and still there are people that go, uh, and, and not just thousands of years later, while he was here, <laughs> where he fed over 5,000 people over this time and 4,000 this time, walking on water, and some people are like, nah. And others were like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> I, some people felt a sense of awe at his presence. And other people felt a sense of irritation at the same presence. And so this month, as we begin this series called the King of Kings, the King of Kings, I want to begin this series with us looking at a dynamic called the power of paradox the power paradox now there's other books that are actually called the power paradox that have n they're not talking about anything I'm talking about today but but when we think about Jesus Christ being a king we, we have to <laughs> this this is a reality that kind of marks not just who he is in the world and and after he's left and now sits on the throne, but, but who he is to us, that there is a power paradox. And it doesn't change. It doesn't move. It's something we lean into. And it's something that changes our lives the more we understand it. And the more of this reality we live in our lives. Now, some of you are stuck on the word paradox. You're like, what? Hold on. Um, what, what was that? Well, well simply put, Simply put, a, a paradox is, is, a, is a seemingly absurd or self-contradictory statement or proposition that when investigated or explained, it may prove to be well-founded or true. It's a contradictory statement that involves truth, often a surprising truth. Like being born a king in a manger. It, it seems contradictory. And so, some examples that we see, like in, in literature, in, in Hamlet, uh, we, we find this statement, I have to be cruel in order to be kind. That's a paradox. Uh, close your eyes so you can see. A paradox. The more shorter forms of paradoxes are what we call oxymorons. Like a, usually a, a two-word thing. They're like, like, like jumbo shrimp. Jumbo. See, you get it, right? It's just, it just, you get the contradiction, but yet you get the reality, like jumbo shrimp compared to the other shrimp. Like jumbo. Like some dude that's 6'5", 300 pounds, named Tiny. Like somebody's discernment was off. The, this is not how this guy ended up. Right? It's, it's a paradox. It's something that, 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 that there's, there's truth, but there's some contradiction. There, there's some opposites that, that you're faced with the reality of things that don't seem to line up. But yet, there's true. It's true. And, and part of this for us is that what draws the line between these contradictions, what seems wrong, you know, one, like, like white over here, but black over here, right? What, what seems up over here, but down over here. What usually is what's drawn the line in the middle is the, the difference between what we physically see, evidence, 
physical reality and spiritual reality. Physical evidence and spiritual truth. That oftentimes creates for us a paradox. And for some, it is so offensive to their intellect that they reject it altogether. For others, it sparks a curiosity that they lean into it and say, what is this all about? So some people hated Jesus and others gave their lives for him. The same person, the same sermons, the same teachings, the same miracles, and he rejected by some and others were obsessed with following him. One time Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood in John chapter 6. And there's a huge crowd of people and they're like, you know what? Yeah, that's, that's where I draw the line right there. Um, I, don't, I don't know, but we don't, we don't do the, the cannibalism thing. I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't get down with that. Can't get down with that. Um, and, and the thing is, you know, like even today in churches, some folks, uh, some things that are just common to us as Christians, we just are used to it. But other people don't, they don't get it, right? You let somebody come walking in here, we talk about, are we going to wash everybody in the blood of Jesus? Like, uh, not, not today. <laughs> no, 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 honey, grab the kids. <laughs> honey, grab the kids. <laughs> They're pouring blood on people. Like, what? Like, that doesn't, you know, or, or this is my body broken for you. Eat this and, and do this in remembrance of me. People are like, what? I was told the Christians are crazy. Now I've seen it myself. There, there are things that just seem to be weird about what we believe. But it's true. <laughs> God impregnated a teenager. Mm. Come on, man. Look, I get it, but it's true. <laughs> he died on the cross and rose from the, gate, from the grave on the third day, and he said it was going to happen. Like, come, that's the best you got? Yeah. Because it's <laughs> true. Uh, what I want you to well, listen, y'all, there's a reason why we look weird to the world. They're not crazy. What we're talking about is crazy. Stop being offended by their calling you crazy, by their lack of understanding of how you deal with the power paradox, how you deal with these seemingly contradictory statements. Physical evidence and spiritual realities. They both can be true. And they're weird. So, so some, some, some statements, when Jesus came, we, we see some statements in scripture from Jesus. We see some things from the apostle Paul in, in Matthew chapter 23, verse 11. You know, Jesus is teaching his disciples. He says, the greatest among you will be your servant. Paradox. If it wasn't a paradox, he wouldn't have to teach it. He's having to teach it because this is a different way of doing things. And now he, in the conversation he has with Pilate, he's going to explain it like right out. It's just going to say it. Boom. Like this is what it's all about. But let's look at a few more, few more examples in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse, verse 10. Paul says this. He's talking about having this thorn in his flesh and taking this, this complaint to God and God didn't take it away. He says, so, so, and God says, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul. Like, I don't have to take the, the thorn away. My grace is sufficient for you. And I've got so much power in my grace that if you think about my grace, let my grace do a work in you, you it will, my, the power of my grace will eclipse the pain and irritation of this thorn. And so Paul had, he, he, had, a, he had a shift of his perspective. He had a shift of, because at first he thought, man, this thorn in my flesh is aggravating me. I'm, th so the solution is God's going to take it away. God, take it away. God says, no. Okay, maybe you didn't hear me. God, no, for real. Like, stop playing. Like, take, take the thorn away. He's like, no, I'm not, I'm not going to take it away. Okay, no, seriously, I got ministry to do, right? You call me to do the thing. And I'm trying to do the thing. And the thorns bother me. I can't do my thing with this thing. And, and the apostle Paul, a person who we would say is an expert in the grace of God. 
He knew about God's grace to forgive, God's grace to save. He knew about that. He committed his life to talking about the, the, the goodness of God's grace, right? I, I am what I am by the grace of God. 1 Corinthians 15, Acts 20, verse 21. He says, I'm considering myself worth nothing unless I'm just telling people about the grace of God. Like he knows about the grace, but he didn't know this about God's grace. And so when he is complaining to God about the storm, God says, my grace is for this too. My grace is sufficient for you. The light bulb comes on for Paul. He goes, oh, okay, I get it. So then he says, so I take pleasure in my weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and in difficulties for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, I am strong. Paradox. That God's strength is made perfect in my weakness. Paradox. I feel physically disempowered, physically weak, physically fainting. And in the midst of my physical reality, he reminds me of a spiritual reality that changes my physical reality. Paul, my, my grace is for the thorn too. Ah, oh, I don't know why I didn't see that. Then let me shift and let me lean into this paradox of your power in my weakness. So let me lean even more. The more I even ad admit my weakness, the more I can experience your power. You see, that, that's what it means to lean into the power paradox. To lean into the seemingly contradiction because that's where the power is. Power in weakness. Power in vulnerability. Power in transparency. Power in, 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 in victory when, when it doesn't seem like that's what's happening. Paul says, 2 Corinthians 8 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. <laughs> okay. Okay. Did I need a private school for this one? Did I need? Oh, come on. Come on. This. What? What? He was rich, became poor, so that those of us who are poor become rich. He became like us so that us could become like him. Paradox, but powerful. Even Paul says the preaching of the cross is like foolishness to those who are lost but to those of us who are saved it is the power of God how is it the power of God and foolishness it's about what you perceive yeah there it is it's about what you perceive it's about what you perceive John the Baptist wrestled with this John committed his life to preparing the way for Jesus and then on that one day, Jesus is coming and John stops the sermon. Ho, 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 stop the music. Behold, the Lamb of God who's come to take away the sins of the world. There he is right there. Then Jesus says, John, why don't you baptize me? Me baptizing you? You should be baptizing paradox. You should be baptizing me. No, 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 John, stop chipping. Listen, it's the scripture. It's the scripture. Go and baptize me. Because this is what the word says is going to happen. So... He commits his whole life pointing to Jesus, pointing to Jesus. And then John gets thrown into prison. And the same man who says, I've come to preach deliverance to the captives. And John the Baptist is like, yeah, that would be nice. When John is in prison, about to be beheaded, and the person who's come to preach deliverance to the captives, John's cousin, doesn't come to visit him in prison. Doesn't come to get him out. John is dealing with a paradox and John says, I need somebody to go check and make sure that's the right person because right now I'm wrestling with a paradox, a seemingly contradiction. 
And Jesus says, man, blessed are those who are not offended by me. Who aren't offended by the paradoxes, who aren't offended by the seemingly surface level contradictions. Go tell John the things that you have seen. I'm going to do, but I mean, that's your cousin. Ain't you going to visit him? No. But you're not going to get your boy out like he, he baptized you and everything, right? He signed your certificate, baptism, and you, like you're not, you're not going to go get your boy out? Mm -mm. Paradox. Some of you are hearing a paradox right now. I feel illness and sickness in my body, but I have a God who's a healer. Paradox. I believe in, in abundance and finances and things like this, but I, my, my big count doesn't look that way. Paradox. Those are realities we live in. And it's not unique. That's what I'm trying to tell you. That doesn't mean something is wrong. The power paradox. This Jesus. Let's look at this. This Jesus. King. King of kings. Let's look what happened to him. How does he show up? Does he show up on this, on this white horse? No, not the first time. He's like, no, that's, I'm taking the best for last. You're going to want to. <laughs> You're going to want to catch the last chapter, I'm telling you right now. Because when I come back, it's going to be on. But the first time, no one's even going to know. The first time, I'm going to be laid in a food trough. What? This is why people didn't accept him, right? This is a guy from Nazareth talking about he's the king. From Nazareth? Nah, player. Mm -mm. Nah, ain't no king coming from Nazareth. Mm -mm. It, 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 paradox. They don't. It's, it's you don't get it. It doesn't make sense, right? So here's what happens when Jesus is standing before Pilate. He makes a statement to Pilate, and Pilate is the one who has the decision to crucify Jesus or not. All these charges have been drummed up about Jesus, and uh, and some of them are true. Jesus was guilty of treason. <laughs> In a kingdom, when you say you are the king, when another king is ruling the kingdom, that's called treason. That was, that was the problem. He's claiming himself to be king. And Pilate even though you find no fault in him, if this gets back to Caesar, that you allowed somebody who's claiming to be king to rise up on your watch, your head is going to be rolling. The pilot's like, look, okay, I got nothing to do with this, but I'm just, I got to do this, right? Self-preservation means I got I to do this. But in this conversation, Pilate's trying to ask him some questions before he issues his, his final judgment. And Pilate's like, Let's, let's have a conversation, man. I need to understand what's going on here. And Jesus says a statement, John 18, verse 36. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. So you are saying you're a king. Yeah, if you're listening. My kingdom is different. It's not of this world. I don't do things. If my kingdom were of this world, we'd be jacking you up right now. That's what he said. Yeah, we'd be wrecking all this up right here. We'd be, it'd all be, be torn down. Right? Do you see what I did in the temple? Yeah, that's just an appetizer. Like, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't even really mad. I wasn't even really mad. <laughs> so trust me, Mr. Pontius Pilate, if I want it to go down, it can go down. But that's not how I do it. 
my kingdom is not of this world. If it was, I'd fight the way you fight. I don't fight the way you fight. I, as the king, serve. I, the one who is all powerful, offer my life for those with no power. I, as the one who is innocent, give my life for all the guilty. I created the heavens and the earth, and I'm going to let you put nails in my hands and nails in my feet. So don't get it twisted, Pilate. The only power you have is what my father gave you. I'm only here because he wants me here. I'm here to do his will. But don't be deceived by what things look like physically. You haven't even seen my kingdom. My kingdom is not of this world. And those who follow me live out that reality as well. That you can see the different nature of my kingdom and how they live. You can see the paradox of my power and how they trust and believe me. They trust and believe what I say, spiritual truth, no matter what their physical circumstances say. They live in paradoxes every day. Because they're in my kingdom and my kingdom is not of this world. And so we see this statement at the end of Jesus' life as he's, going, he's about to go to the cross and then die and be raised again and then go back to glory. But he begins with some events that surround our focus for this season of Christmas. Being born in Bethlehem of Judea being born and he has this nickname called the son of David King David right Judah Lion of the tribe. And, and Pastor Brandon shared a few weeks ago about some interesting facts about David didn't he some things that most people don't even think about but it's right there it's right there we know that David is an amazing king wrote all these psalms you know and all these wonderful things about David's life but the reason, as he mentioned, the reason why when Jesse was approached by Samuel to have all his sons lined up and David was out on the hillside and David was not included in that lineup is because Jesse and some other woman had David. And he didn't consider David a legitimate son. Jesse, line up all your sons. Here they are right here. And God says, no, they're not. Because even if Jesse doesn't consider him legitimate, I do. And he's the king. David says, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my father and mother conceive me. That, that goes over our head, doesn't it? Yeah, Jesse had another baby mama that was different than his other sons. Here's my point. That doesn't matter to God. Even when David commits adultery and murder, there's, there's so much forgiveness there that through the same lineage, God's going to have his son come down, Jesus, and his nickname is Son of David. What? <laughs> Paradox. <laughs> you think you got problems. Like it's <laughs> Son of David. David the, the king and the adulterer and the murderer. Son of David. 
All right, Bartimaeus. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. It's a paradox. And so, so Jesus has this whole other kingdom. Now here's the backdrop. Like all that was my introduction. <laughs> Paradox. <laughs> I love it. That was awesome. That was awesome. So, so let's get to the to the to the main text. And now, as we read this main text for today, you're gonna look at it through the lens of a power paradox. In Matthew chapter two, beginning of verse one. And Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod. Wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who is born King of the Jews? For we saw his star at its rising and have come to worship him. So it makes sense. If you're looking for a King of the Jews... You go to Jerusalem, the capital of all the Jews. And guess what? He ain't there. Paradox. When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed. <laughs> now, if you don't know some of his, his background, Herod was a bit crazy. Okay, to say the least, he was a bit crazy. So it says he was deeply disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. That's why. Because if he's upset, we got problems. He was deeply. So here's a king hearing about another king being born. He's got problems here. So he assembled all the chief priests and scribes of the people. These were Jews, right? He assembled all the chief priests, the Jewish chief priests, and the Jewish scribes, people who would know the Old Testament, who would know the law, who would know all the prophecies, and he asked them where the Messiah would be born. And interestingly enough, they said exactly what needed to be said. In Bethlehem of Judea. Because this is what was written by the prophet. So this is, the, now the, verse 6 is a, a, the, the prophet Micah. Hundreds of years ago, this is what the prophet Micah said about this. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, because out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people. That's what the prophet Micah said hundreds of years ago. And so when King Herod hears about this king being born, he gets the people who's supposed to know about this prophecy. He says, hey, what, what's, what's up with this, this whole king thing? Have y'all heard about this? They go, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, wait, where, where is this, this Messiah? Oh, he's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. So the king's like, okay, that's, what, that's where these guys were going. Like these, here's the thing. These guys know something, and my people know something. Okay. All right, we, we got to eliminate this king. So this is what it says. Then Herod secretly summoned the wise men and asked them the, the, the time, the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem. And said, go and search carefully for the child. When you find him, report back to me so that I too can go and worship him. Now, that's a lie, right? After hearing the king, they went on their way. And there it was, the star that they had seen at its rising. It led them until it came and stopped above the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy. Entering the house... They saw the child with Mary, his mother, and falling to their knees, they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another route. These men were from Arabia. Being from Arabia, 
These men were not Jews. They were Gentiles. On the night that Jesus is born, he's laid in a manger. On the night that Jesus is born, the angels sang in the sky and announced it to the shepherds. And the shepherds came on the night that Jesus was born. The wise men did not come on the night that Jesus was born. The shepherds came from the hillsides of Bethlehem into the city of Bethlehem. Plenty of time to get there. The wise men came from many, many miles away. And so when they got here to the house, there are no animals. There's no sheep, no hay, no swaddling clothes. Little baby Jesus is probably walking by now. Maybe running around and stuff, getting into things. And Joseph and Mary had to baby proof the house. Y- y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Like that, that's, that's what's happening here. So we see these images of the wise men and the shepherds all in the same. That, that, that's not, that's cute, but that's not true. Right? There's a difference between a paradox and a lie. And that's a lie. So, but, but what, what we see here is this. Here's what's weird. These, these men who were, who were wealthy, right? If I'm giving away gold, you can assume I got, there's more that came from. <laughs> they're getting away and, and, and so gold uh, gold mining in Arabia was like a big thing everybody knew about that same way with, with frankincense and myrrh came from a lot of the trees in southern Arabia so just gold frankincense and myrrh if you didn't know anything about them you go all oh, these people came from Arabia uh, if you're in that, in that area you, you, you know that's, that's typical about, about the, just like out here right if someone says oh, I just bought you some of the best wine you would assume it maybe it came from Napa you know you wouldn't go oh man was, was, did Israelis have it on sale like you wouldn't think that you, you think so so culturally there there are certain el- there are certain things that um, that characterize certain certain geographies and they, they, they knew that but here, here's my point here you have this guy he's born king of the Jews and he's being honored and worshiped by people who are not Jews even in his earlier years we see the Jewish shepherds worshiping him and the Gentile wise men worshiping him. And here as a baby, the creator of the world can't even wipe himself. The creator of the world can't speak words. A baby in a manger, probably under two Matter of fact, later on you see Herod realized the wise men tricked him and they didn't come back to tell him. And so he's like, okay, based on what the wise men said, when they saw the star, this baby's probably two years and under. So he, he has this whole, every, all the two-year-olds and under, he tells them, uh, he sends people to kill the babies in Bethlehem two years and under. You go, wait a minute. In the birth of Jesus... Jesus being king, this is supposed to be like amazing and awesome. Like, why would Matthew even put put that in there? That a lot of babies got killed trying to kill Jesus. Why would Matthew include that story in, in here? That's intentional. Because Matthew is writing to Jews, helping Jews understand the kingship of Jesus. And one thing Jews wouldn't understand the slaughter of infants trying to kill somebody, they would go, Moses. Deliverer. So Matthew includes this. Right alongside the story. Born king of the Jews. Here is the Messiah. And a bunch of other babies got killed because Herod was trying to kill the Messiah. This, tra- this tragedy, right alongside this miracle story, this joy. They worshipped him and bowed down. And then Herod killed a bunch of babies. Paradox. And the other message that 
Matthew is trying to communicate is here is another picture of the evil of humanity. The manifestation of the evil of humanity right alongside how God is just getting the party started. How God sends his son into this world. Light has come into darkness. The paradox. I am the light of the world. Paradox. And so this young king, this young infant, this young toddler, he's the king. And it doesn't look like it physically. Mary is not all dressed up. Joseph's not all dressed up. He's not in the palace. He's in the little house. And the wise men come and say, we understand a power paradox. Even as a little toddler running around, he is king. He's king. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We've come a long way for this moment. It's not what it looks like. It's a paradox. He may be two, but he's creator. He's eternal. He may seem helpless, but he's all powerful. <laughs> he may have a runny nose, but he's the healer. <laughs> Power paradox. And when you look at Jesus, you either see him as king or you see him as crazy. We choose to see him as king. We choose, even as a baby, he's the visible image of the invisible God. We choose to see that even as an infant, he is the most powerful person that has ever walked the earth. We choose to see that in this little toddler is the word. And the word was with God and was in the beginning with God. And nothing was made that was made without this little kid making it. We choose to see the power paradox. Yes, he's a baby, but he's king. He seems weak, but he's all powerful. And in his power, he who was rich became poor so that those of us who are poor would become rich. That's what the power paradox is all about. He's a king, but a servant king. He's a king, but a savior king. Other kings try to conquer people so they can amass power. But when you have all power, you can afford to give it away without losing any of it yourself. Let me end with this statement. And then I want to play a short video that I think will sum it up. There's a, a quote by D. Blair Smith. He says this, the miracle of the incarnation is that this one person became everything we are without ceasing to be everything that he is. He became everything we are without ceasing to be everything that he is. Let's play this clip and then we'll, we'll end. The Bible says he's a king of the Jews. He's a king the of Israel. He's a king video. of righteousness. He's a king Go of the Go ahead and pa pause the video and let's, let's start over from the beginning. He's a king of heaven. He's a king. Because I want y'all to get this right here. The Bible says he's a king of the Jews. He's a king of Israel. He's a king of righteousness. He's a king of the ages. He's a king of heaven. He's a king of glory. He's a king of kings. And he is the Lord of lords. Now that's my king. Do you know him? No means of measure can define his limitless love. Well, well, he's in turnless form. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's impurely powerful. And he's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's God's son. He's 
He's a sinner's savior. He's a centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. Well, he's the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's a fundamental doctrine of true theology. Do you know him? He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He, he delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. Do you know him? My king is a key of knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? His life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. Well, I wish I could describe him to you. But he, he's indescribable. He's indescribable. Yeah. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mouth. You can't get him off of your hands. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. That's my king. Yeah! He always has been. And he always will be. I'm talking about he had no predecessor. And he'll have no successor. You can't even keep him and he's not going to resign. That's my Let's all stand. That's, that's our king. And we see the spiritual truth beyond the physical evidences. He seems weak, but he's so powerful. And people couldn't get beyond that contradiction. They say, if he's this, why doesn't he do this? Because his kingdom is not of this world. So come down off the cross and save yourself. If you are who you are, like that wouldn't make sense. My kingdom is not of this world. I don't do things the way you do them. And the key that makes the difference is when Paul says in Philippians, he humbled himself and took upon himself the form of a servant. Humility is the key to the power paradox. Like a sheep among wolves a lamb going to the slaughter. Humility. Humility. Born in a manger. From Nazareth. Humility. Humility. All knowledgeable but not judgmental. Humility. Humility. Loving. Without pointing out all your stuff. Humility. Accepting. The woman with the issue of blood, Zacchaeus, Bartimaeus, among those who are hurting, he is power under control. His meekness is a weakness. And as you and I learn from the king of all kings how to live, you'll see that that humility is what changes the way we show up in our relationships. Humility in conversations with your spouse and with your children and at work and with your neighbors. Humility. We can step into the power paradox 
and say, I don't have to be offended by what you said. I can still love you. Rationally, I should be mad, but his kingdom is not of this world, and neither am I. Father, help us to be living examples of the power paradox we see in Christ. Help us develop that humility in us where we can live based on spiritual truths and by faith regards to what physical circumstances look like. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Praise God.